We have a, an entertaining pa panel today. Um, Bill Burke White, who's the head of uh, Perry World House, has been a, a colleague and very supportive of, of our work here at Annenberg uh, from the law school perspective. And it's, it's really a thrill having him here. In a certain sense, thinking about international relations and this book. Uh, Ellen Goodman is uh, also a very old friend of mine, has been a key figure in thinking about speech and society, has been very central in rethinking certain elements of the Federal Communications Commission uh, and public broadcasting, and has bridged uh, private practice and acad academic life, and is now at Rutgers uh, Camden. Um, Carolyn Marvin is the Francis Yates Professor of Communication here, needs no introduction, and is, is I think that's true, is it? I think, so I won't give one. <laughs> but uh, has been uh, an extraordinary colleague and has, has been committed to thinking about freedom of speech in society. And so we thought this would be a really interesting panel to discuss the issues uh, re represented in the book. Um, the book is going to be on sale if anybody wishes to do it. And for a slightly uh, diminished charge, I will sign the book if anybody <laughs> so wishes. Uh, I was just going to say the way we're going to do this is I'm going to speak for about five or seven minutes, and then uh, the panel in an order, which we haven't yet determined, is going to speak, and then we're going to we're going to interchange as, as informally as we should speak. So, uh, in in thinking about um, what I'd say, I, I I thought of alternate titles to the book. I this book is is designed for googling. Basically, it's keywords. It's a keyword title. Uh, and I, 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 in some sense, I, I dislike the title because it's so functional and it doesn't necessarily describe totally the innards of the book. So one, one thought I, I uh, was to call it the anxieties of free expression, uh, to mark a, a moment in which free expression is, uh, is either an object of, of total fear to leaders and powers around the world because of its disruptive nature, and it's also uh, a, an anxiety of fear of here because this is supposed to be the great moment to realize free expression because of new technologies, et cetera. And the question is whether these, these opportunities are fleeting or being submerged or being subverted. So uh, there are anxieties of hope, anxieties of fear. And I, it seemed to me an interesting way to organize a book about free expression. But I wasn't courageous enough to use this as the title. So that was Anxieties of, of Free Expression. Another potential title might have been Adventures in the Markets for Loyalty. So uh, one of my favorite writings was in a book called Media and Sovereignty, in which I tried to talk about uh, a, a market for loyalties in which large-scale competitors for allegiances use the regulation of communications to car organize a cartel of imagery and identity. So the idea here is that the world is composed of large-scale competitors for allegiances, and state regulators parcel these out and, and their shares in, these, in this market for loyalties. And the question is, how, how are these shares changed and shifted? And more important, how in a new environment with social media, et cetera, et cetera, is this is this uh, dissolved? In other words, is the model of a market for loyalties that is cartelized in some way still uh, applicable? Are there efforts to engage in such cartels, in such restrictions, in such regulations? And how do they work either nationally or internationally? So <clears throat> a lot of what I was interested in the book was this idea of, did the idea of a market for loyalties sustain itself? Did it alter? How did it alter? Who are the new competitors? Who are the new strategic players? What are the new techniques to ban or otherwise violate, uh, shape these markets? Uh, a, th a third way to characterize the, to, to, to entitle the book would have been state resilience. That it's related to the first subject, but would, the second subject would be how, how do states which are said to be on the way out revive themselves? How do they reorganize? How do they think about this? And how do they think about information if, if information is such a corrosive uh, pr process? And then uh, finally, um, I, I, I was going to revisit some work called The Enabling Environment for Free and Independent Media, or 
the enabling environment for free expression. And I tried in the book, this was a very, for me, a hard task, and I'm not sure how far I got, to think about what I call foundational assumptions and institutional settings for free expression. What, what are the prerequisites? What, what are the institutions that surround our idea of free expression? And are they under, a, how, how, how does one think of their corrosiveness? And here I was somewhat led by the work of, of, of the late C. Edwin Baker, who is such a wonderful colleague, and I'm really sorry that he isn't with us anymore. But he, he really thought about this process of um, taking the kind of givens of free expression and questioning them, questioning them not to undermine free expression, but to give us a firmer base for thinking about free expression in society. In thinking uh, specifically about some of the current things that are involved in this, uh, let, let me say one, one last thing, which is the, what I call the trans-frontier aspects of this, is, is a, a notion that we live in a, a world of strategic communication in which external, effort, external players powerfully penetrate other societies. And the question is, how, what's, the, what's the potential democratic response or non-democratic response of those societies? So for, I see Imad here, the, the, uh, I worked on a, a chapter called Soft War in Iran. And the question was, how does Iran perceive the uh, imagery pouring into its borders, and what capacity does it have to regulate and constrain those images? But this, this goes to ultimately to the question of international norms. Do we have an international norm of um, uh, the uh, right to receive and impart information regardless of frontiers? It's a, a magic phrase that appears in Article 19, and I think that phrase has been inadequately examined. Do we really mean that there's a right to receive and impart information regardless of frontiers? What's the, what's the capacity within Article 19 or other international norms to, to mold that trans-border speech? And what, what's the notion, especially when it's strategic and trying to alter sort of basic concepts of religion, politics, et cetera, within the target society? So these are some ways of starting to think about the book and starting to think about the conversation that we can have today. So who wants to go first? Do you want to, should we do it left to right or right to right? Ellen. Ellen. Ellen is such, this is so, this is so typical of Ellen. Well, to I'm, I'm she was, by the way, the best student in her third grade class for this. No, season. because I, I have to leave a little early to teach. So, um, uh, so that was the deal of my, okay. my coming. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, this book, if, if you haven't read it, is just so Monroe. It's so um, sprawling and ambitious and, um, and brilliant. And I love that you start out by talking about anxieties, like the good Viennese that you are. And that also um, uh, was very intriguing to me. And so I, one of the things that, that Monroe says in this book about anxieties is that, of course, they characterize different competing narratives, but they also coexist um, together in each narrative, uh, the anxiety of, of hope and the anxiety of fear. Um, and that is really uh, natural if you think about the infrastructure that we're talking about. So the infrastructure, whether we're talking about broadband or satellites, terrestrial radio, mobile, these are all covered in the book. Um, they, they have characteristics of what de Sola Poole called technologies of freedom. Um, they spread opportunities for expression, of course, but the same technologies make hospitable host bodies uh, for surveillance, hacking, and insecurity. Um, so the features of openness of the internet are also its bugs. And in a way, for me, one of the themes of this book was this constant play between features and bugs, and indeed the shifting designations of what actually is a feature and what is a bug, and this depends on the strategic narrative that one advances. Um, so I just want to focus in this, you know, this, is, this book is really kaleidoscopic, and I'll focus on just two points. Um, using the language of my discipline of communications policy, um, which are network layers and convergence. Monroe tells us that 
strategic communication about and through information ar architectures is rampant. So everyone is doing it. It's not merely the province of marketers and PR firms, states, proto-states, NGOs, other civil society institutions, and of course individuals are constantly engaged in branding. They seek to manage their message and to reach what he calls technological closure around narratives of innovation and networking. And indeed, it's the failure to successfully manage their brand identity that leads individuals to seek intervention in the form of a right to be forgotten um, or delisting uh, from search engines. So one can think of the strategic communication percolating through uh, and affecting operations at three different layers of information architecture. And these are layers that um, uh, we typically uh, designate in communications policy. So one is the infrastructure layer at the bottom. These are the cables, the spectrum, um, the servers. The second layer in the middle is the services layer, the ISPs, search, social platforms. And then the third at the top is the content layer, applications as well as programming and user-generated <coughs> content. So Monroe shows us how um, there's this penetration and interpenetration of strategic communications through these layers. And I, I found one of the most fascinating chapters um, to be uh, about religion and about the interplay between religious uh, competition for adherence, or religion's competition for adherence, and the state's interest in regulating this competition. And one of the ways the state does this um, is by opening or closing access at the infrastructure layer, uh, including broadcast and satellite channels to evangelists um, in the early days and more recently you know, access to, to satellite. Um, and these changes at the infrastructure layer then change the strategic conversation at the content layer. Um, this is what Monroe calls the jurisprudence of platforms. In the United States, the First Amendment is the chief arbiter of the jurisprudence of platforms. Um, as it is the jurisprudence of religion. Uh, it inserts itself into battles over relative strengths of voices and religions in the public sphere. Um, it pulls levers at the infrastructure layer and at the content layer and everywhere in between, creating speech and religious ecosystems. And I, I will say one, something more about the First Amendment in a minute. Um, and then, of course, private parties are powerful players also in working these levers. Um, they too are what Monroe calls information architects. So another, the book that um, I was sort of reading side by side with this was mm -hmm. um, Josie Van Dyke's fascinating study of Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit, and some other um, uh, social network platforms called The Culture of Connectivity. And she shows how these platforms implement their own strategies for commodifying social relationships um, in the form of algorithms, for example, for what's trending or for news feeds and recommendations. Uh, and then these strategies also show up in the te technical affordances that were given uh, to uh, shape the range of what we can express. We can like things, we can favorite things, um, and the ways in which select influencers gain more traction through the network. Um, another Monroe, when he speaks of the anxiety of hope or the anxiety of fear, is generally talking about um, anxieties at the structural level. I think a comparable anxiety uh, we feel at the personal level is the fear of missing out or FOMO. Um, so FOMO pushes us to accept our way into more apps, more devices, and ultimately um, into a world of connected things, all the while giving away more of our privacy and possibly our, <laughs> the autonomy to actually choose among competing narratives. Um, states experience this anxiety of fear. I think, I think sometimes you call it anxiety of power, but I might be wrong about that. Um, as intermediaries accumulate more and more because we are giving more and more um, uh, data to them. And I think we can see this anxiety in Europe's new antitrust lawsuit against Google. Um, ironically, uh, Europe has responded to this anxiety also by handing Google ever more power in its right to be forgotten decision. Um, this decision, of course, requires Google to decide in the dark and without any public oversight when to grant a search subject's request to delist information that is, uh, quote, inadequate, irrelevant, or no longer relevant 
And I think um, this, in some sense, this reliance on intermediaries born of a, um, an anxiety of fear um, is what Monroe points to when he says, quote, governments and other strategic communicators seek to shift the discourse from providing safe harbors for the new intermediaries, this is what they used to do, um, to making them more responsible, enlarging their roles as mediating gatekeepers or through processes of surveillance aiding the government. So in other words, we're afraid of inter we governments are afraid of intermediaries, um, uh, but in order to sort of cope with this anxiety, we end up giving them um, more power and then relying on them for surveillance. Um, and the last thing I'll say about this uh, uh, sort of how the um, strategic communications and responses to these anxieties work through these network layers um, is a word about privacy. So uh, Monroe, when you talk about Article 19 and what do we really mean, what do we really mean by freedom of expression um, in the book, you, you suggest that we haven't quite worked through um, the conflicts, particularly between privacy and expression uh, and sort of the, the um, erection of large businesses and business models on the basis of uh, personal data. Um, and there's a lot we could talk about, about um, the right to be forgotten and other sort of s steps to protect privacy. I, I just wanted to say that, um, uh, you know, there's one way to view privacy and free expression, of course, is complementary. We need a zone of privacy in order to develop as human beings, in order to freely express ourselves. Um, increasingly, privacy and free expression are at odds, uh, as we see in the right to be forgotten, and at odds depending on your strategic narrative and your jurisdiction. Um, I think in the U.S., a, a really big conflict between privacy and free expression um, is brewing, and perhaps only in the U.S. because of our peculiar, um, and in my opinion, increasingly irrational First Amendment jurisprudence. So there's a 2011 case, Sorrell versus IMS Health, which held on a broad reading that privacy laws that restrict data flows violate the First Amendment because data, these data flows are themselves um, free speech protected by the First Amendment. Um, under this broad reading, there are other ways to read the case, uh, any law that restricts data flows in the name of privacy arguably violates um, free speech. That kind of reading uh, will put an end to many privacy controls in this country and put the U.S. on a collision course um, with much of the rest of the world. Uh, I think I won't talk much about convergence um, because I've, I'll, I'll, it'll take me over, except to say that um, one, I, I thought, Monroe, that you you emphasized, um, you clearly emphasized the competition between strategic narratives. Um, in my view, there's also a convergence of strategic narratives, and it's it's on this sort of incantation of innovation. Um, so, in some sense, uh, there is, um, and and of course, innovation uh, is so plastic and elastic; it can mean anything. It can mean anything from the newest iWatch app to an ISIS video. Um, uh, it can mean innovation at the core of the network or innovation at the edge. And so, for example, in the net neutrality open networks debate, both sides claim that they are on the side of innovation. So I think one thing to, to look for in these strategic narratives and the competition between these strategic narratives is to one, what extent both sides are trying to appropriate um, this, this the concept, the word of innovation, and how differently um, they may define it. And I will just close with a word about um, transparency. So Monroe points out many times um, in the book that, um, that, that the phenomena that he's describing are not new. We've always had a competition for allegiances, um, communications access controls, et cetera. He says what's new is the scale, globalization, the technologies, um, and he observes I think Riley that states no longer have to shutter newsrooms or gun down journalists to control information, though they may, they still do that. Um, instead, they can manage routing, speed, access to servers. So, quoting him, visible and contestable moments where a state is seen formally to, to censor will become fewer and fewer as additional and new structural arrangements are substituted as controls. 
So in other words, there is no more transparency of control. And I think these, um, another anxiety um, over the hidden cogs of control have spurred pushes for transparency. Um, and I think we need to be a little careful about this. In some sense, transparency is the fool's gold of communications policy, promises so much. If, if only we can get the intermediaries to disclose their algorithms, if only we can get the government to tell us what it's um, uh, surveilling, if only we could get the data brokers to disclose what they have on you, then everything would be okay and we wouldn't have to make these difficult normative choices and really sort out the features from the bugs and make the trade-offs between them. Um, and I think we're, we're far from getting that kind of transparency, but I think we should think more about if we got it, what would we do with it? Um, and uh, I, my hunch is that um, it actually wouldn't advance, uh, it, it wouldn't um, uh, alleviate this anxiety all that much. That's it. Thanks. Yes. Converging words that everyone skirts behind, but I want to make a plug for Gabriella Coleman's talk tomorrow on, which is partly on hacker spaces, because hacker spaces is one arena where the whole drama of innovation is played out, or who's trying to seize the notion that they're the innovative society, that they're the innovative players, et cetera, et cetera. So that's tomorrow at noon. Carolyn, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm happy to. And uh, I want to echo what. Ellen said about the, you know, the great advantage of a book that gives us new vocabulary to think about some situations that we've had a sort of way of thinking about, but here are some new possibilities. And so I'm thinking about terms like strategic architecture and narratives legitimacy and asymmetric concept um, texts and the market for loyalties and pillarization and all of these kinds of things. And uh, Monroe gives us this new vocabulary for thinking about anxieties um, and frames it as this uh, collision of old patterns of regulation uh, and changing patterns of dissemination and entry. And I found, like Ellen, uh, in some ways one of the most compelling chapters, um, the chapter about uh, religion. Uh, where some of the most interesting action, I think, is right now globally in freedom of expression, uh, and particularly the growth of religious influence with new opportunities for uh, uh, proselytization and, and communication as a result of uh, technology and globalization. So, you know, I thought it would be very interesting to consider a kind of diagnostic of um, of a particular anxiety in the West about the challenge that's being posed by certain strains of Islam uh, to these old patterns of regulation and what how this might cause us to think about it a little bit uh, differently. So uh, the two old patterns that I wanted to consider were uh, the Enlightenment settlement uh, that in the United States takes the form of uh, pluralism. So the idea there is that to see the First Amendment not as just this completely open, anything goes kind of architecture, but um, as a way of uh, keeping religion as a kind of domesticated pet. Uh, and the the idea being that you can... Uh, the purpose of the First Amendment is to, um, um, to, I mean, it's a very hopeful idea based on the Enlightenment experience that religion will go away or not be very fierce or whatever. And, and the idea is to weaken it by having it compete with other religions and then deprive it of coercive authority. And that's one model of managing religious con uh, conflict, and that's the old pattern of regulation, and in the case of France, it's laicite. And there is the idea that we will banish religion from the public square and make it invisible. And that is the, you know, in sort of recent years has been this kind of increasing pressure on um, Islam 
uh, within France, and so you know you have, for example, the banning of headscarves first for teachers and then for students, um, and the move against halal food and different things like that. So uh, you know, so the the uh, the question here is um, when uh, globalization and technology lower barriers of entry to religious groupings that were never part of that Enlightenment settlement, and that's what Islam is. I mean, in the United States, you know, the settlement was, it will be a sort of um, openness to Protestantism and then on good behavior, gradually Catholicism and Judaism were admitted to this um, uh, this tolerance. and. Uh, but now you have a, a proselytizing community that's also aggrieved. And so um, that has posed particular, uh, some fairly serious challenges in the last uh, 25 years. And we might start with uh, Salman Rushdie in 1989 and then uh, the fatwa on him for Satanic Verses. And then in 2004, there was the murder of Theo van Gogh um, in the Netherlands and the fatwa on Ayan Ali Hersey. And then in 2005 was the Danish cartoons and then uh, and the death threats associated with that. And then in 2010, this one's a little less well known, I think. And in fact, I'm not talking about everything there is, but the ones that sort of have grabbed the attention uh, in the West, and that is Molly Norris in Seattle, who proposed on Facebook, everybody draw Muhammad Day, and now she's changed her name and um, is in hiding, and that had a very complicated response, and, and of course she proposed that in response to the death threats uh, for Matt Stone and Trey Parker, in their portrayal of, of the, a depiction of Muhammad uh, in the South Park cartoons. And then in 2011, you had uh, Charlie Hebdo um, attracting a violent response for the first time uh, with the magazine, with the issue in which they had it guest edited by Muhammad, and the cover was, uh, if you don't, you know, a, th a hundred, a thousand lashes, if you don't, die laughing, and then there was firebombing. And so then in, um, and then there was another very provocative cover in 2013 where after the Egyptian protests, um, uh, there was a, a Muslim man on the cover and he was holding a Quran and bullets were going through it and it said, you know, the Quran is shit and it doesn't stop bullets. And then we all most recently know about uh, the Charlie Hebdo massacre in 2015. So what was interesting to me was to think about the, the different responses in, in, um, the, in France and in the United States to how did their old, what are the old settlements um, telling the institutions of government and uh, the media about how to respond. And so uh, in France, it, you know, this sort of um, banishing from the public square went immediately into, into high gear. And so hundreds of people actually have been arrested for uh, seeming to sympathize with the terrorists and most, um, most notably, um, I'm sure I'll slaughter the uh, pronunciation here, but <laughs> the uh, comedian um, Judene Mbala Mbala, who tweeted, um, uh, I am in response to the I, je suis Charlie, I am uh, Charlie Kalibali, which is the name of one of the um, assassins. And uh, then other, I mean, they've been roundly criticized for this. And, you know, um, Another really prominent was an eight-year-old kid that was picked up because he said, uh, and taken into custody for a while, because he said, uh, I am with a terrorist. And of course, his father said he didn't really understand what terrorist meant. And then there was a 16-year-old kid who, on Facebook, put a, an ironic version of that 2013 Charlie Hebdo cover in which they had a cartoonist standing behind 
a copy of Charlie Hebdo saying Charlie Hebdo doesn't stop bullets. And so these were seen as sympathetic to the terrorists and there was lots of criticism. The, the sort of debate took the form of, hmm, the French uh, are defending this, um, this speech that is uh, a challenge to Islam, but they're, on the other hand, they punish uh, anti-Semitic speech because it's illegal in France to um, engage in anti-Semitic speech. And, and the, the back and forth there has been along the lines of, well, anti-Semitism is different because it is an insult to a community of people. And uh, Charlie Hebdo is really about a challenge to ideas and religion. And so that's an a distinction that's important. And there's you know debate about whether that's a distinction that's important. And then the United States, I think it's interesting because the pluralist model of the United States had no clear way to respond to this. It, it is not, I mean, the, the French response is consistent and, and highly criticized, but in the, in the United States, what does pluralism mean exactly? What's the response? And so one way of thinking about that is that pluralism means that um, no idea uh, can be unchallenged. And so therefore, uh, you know, when somebody says, I'm going to kill anybody who disagrees with my interpretation of Islam, the appropriate response is to reprint the Ebdo cartoons um, in defense of pluralism. But another pluralist response, of course, is that uh, uh, when, when people, we have to be sensitive to blasphemy. And so therefore, uh, it's important to respond by being respectful of the demands of another religion. And so what, what I found was interesting, uh, which I wouldn't have thought about except for the way Monroe was thinking about this, is that the, the um, media institute, oh, I, did I mention, but Josh Ernest, in terms of the state response, Josh Ernest, who's press secretary, got up and said, gave no direction and said, you know, media institutions should respond as they please, which is kind of uh, contrary to some of the, the things that the State Department has done in the past, or the government, let's say, has done in the past when there was anxiety about a response to Islam. But the, what I found puzzling, you know, and I sort of pose it as a question, is that the legacy media on the whole were those media institutions that refrained from reprinting the cartoon, but the insurgent media, you know, by which I mean online media like Huffington Post and BuzzFeed and um, uh, uh, Daily Beast and things like that, they did reprint the cartoons. So the interesting question is what accounts for that difference? Now that's not an absolute distinction, but it is a fairly consistent pattern. And some people have said, well, it's a clickbait issue. You know, the online media are just simply trying to attract folks. But I don't know whether that completely answers the question. And the other interesting thing is that Twitter, uh, you know, is, uh, we know that Twitter has been recently shutting down uh, all kinds of ISIS websites. Uh, although, and I think the, the Times reported uh, one of those that did not reprint the cartoons, reported last week that, um, or maybe two weeks ago, that in one day, Twitter shut down 9,000 ISIS-related accounts, and they'd been shutting down about 2,000 accounts a week for a while. So, and it's hard to understand, I mean, you know, a lot of those accounts were in Arabic, and it's not clear what metric they're using exactly to... Um, to delete these accounts. And of course, the accounts just come back, so it's not that effective. Uh, but so, you know, there's this kind of mixed up response in the, in the pluralist model as to just what is the appropriate response. So uh, I'm interested in trying to figure out, but I don't have a clue, but maybe you do, is what accounts for this kind of, why should it break along these lines that the insurgent media uh, are reprinting the cartoons and the and the legacy media on the whole or not. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat>
uh, first of all, Monroe, congratulations. I mean, this is a truly superb book, uh, and uh, it is a credit to you and your life's work that you have been able to help us see and reframe and develop the vocabulary uh, that we're all talking about. So uh, I, I can't say more uh, until I have acknowledged uh, your, your just extraordinary work on this. So thank you. Um, I'm going to come at this from a slightly different perspective, which is that I uh, am an international lawyer uh, when I'm with political scientists and a political scientist when I'm with international lawyers, uh, but going to uh, approach it um, you know, from, from those standpoints. But one of the things that I think makes this book so extraordinary is that it is truly uh, interdisciplinarity at its best. The fact that we can have communication scholars, lawyers, political scientists, scholars of religion, all being engaged around it and finding things to work with and finding uh, a language that's helpful to them uh, is exactly the kind of interdisciplinary scholarship um, uh, I hope we can see more of. Um, so I want to start by telling you two stories that have been told too often, uh, but are personal to me because I think they have, this book speaks to them, and that is that I was um, uh, sitting at the U.S. State Department working for Secretary Clinton um, during two uh, moments in communication history, recent communication history, uh, that are often uh, twisted, distorted, and played for, for more than perhaps they're worth. Um, one uh, is, of course, the uh, Iranian a failed revolution in 2009, uh, and the other is the moment of WikiLeaks. Um, and for both of those, I was sitting on the seventh floor of the State Department uh, when, you know, suddenly the question of whether uh, Twitter would stay open or not during uh, during that moment in 2009, uh, and then the second moment when I get the call from from the Secretary's office saying uh, we now have to go through, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of pages of cables that have been. Um, uh, released publicly uh, in violation of, uh, of of security arrangements, um, and we we spin those for lots of different reasons and different stories. But the purpose of my recounting them was to say that at both of those moments, I, as a lawyer, as a political scientist, and a policymaker at that moment, lacked the conceptual framework, or to use the word we've used a few times here, vocabulary, to fully appreciate or understand those moments, and so. Uh, we simply slotted them into our existing mental maps with respect to WikiLeaks. The mental map, if you were sitting at the State Department, was U.S. security law has been breached. Who are we going to prosecute? Who are we going to sue? Um, and then maybe secondly, how do we protect some individuals uh, whose names were, were there? And in the case of Iran, it was a moment where the answer was, well, of course we should be doing everything we can to keep freedom of speech and expression open. Um, now you can step back and see those two, uh, see, see odd contrasts and parallels there. But fundamentally, we did not have a vocabulary to deal deal with the complexities of both of those moments. Um, and what I think this book has done for me is helped give me a vocabulary to start to engage those two moments uh, in a far more nuanced, richer, and, and way that I, I can actually communicate about it um, you know, beyond just uh, the, the sort of stereotypes of those moments. So what, what have you given me as, as someone who was sitting there? Um, first of all, I want to say a few words about the state, the power of the state versus the power of, of, of communication, that, that you know, tension that, that you highlight with far more nuance than we could have um, at that point, um, which is to say uh, that, you know, wither the state in, in this. Um, Law is based around states. States are based around borders. Um, and what I think uh, the, uh, the strategic communications uh, and globalism that you talk about are in, in so much about the breakdown and failure of those mental models. Um, I use the word mental because, yes, they're legal, but they're also the world in which we, at least lawyers and political scientists, sort of are, are enculturated to, to exist. And we have struggled with resolving that through the concept of extraterritoriality and thinking about the extraterritorial reach of our laws. When should they apply to events that occur outside of our territory? But wait a minute, 
with speech? Where does it even occur today? Um, and you then give us the jurisprudence of platforms, which uh, jurisprudence is a good word. It's not yet law, but it is uh, a, a kind of mediation at this, uh, at this critical point, but a point that law has not really been able to fully speak to. Um, Precisely because we exist in a world where law is state-based and those platforms, uh, it is you know you can you can perhaps locate them within states, uh, but their effect reaches far beyond them. Um, the place, though, that I think law has failed the most is understanding the interaction between what you call the jurisprudence of platforms and real-world effects. What I mean by that uh, is that as as one makes changes, as states make regulatory changes or legal decisions um, that affect the, the resolution of who owns and who controls platforms, um, that has enormous repercussions, repercussions that uh, law and lawyers don't really understand. And I think your book is a very helpful way uh, for any judge or any lawyer uh, be, or any policymaker operating in this space to start to try to reconceptualize uh, how choices at these key focal points really uh, impact outcomes. And I think I think you do a fabulous job switching those focal points from trying to, to grapple with this concept of extraterritoriality uh, to one of really trying to look at how you uh, mediate um, and regulate um, you know, within this jurisprudence of, of platforms. Um, that uh, uh, also then points me to a question about audiences. And again, you know, law has focused on a particular audience, which are those uh, to whom its regulations apply. Uh, you know, traditionally, uh, citizens, then those within its territory, and now a much uh, broader audience. But one of the things your book has helped me do is really uh, reconceptualize the audience at whom and to whom regulation is directed in this space. Um, and I'm using audience in two ways here. One is the, 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 the target of the immediate regulatory process. Uh, the other, though, uh, is, is those impacted by it. All of that then points me to the perhaps the fundamental question in international relations, which is sort of what is power and how is power used? Um, and again, you help me re-see power in a different way. Uh, we have long sort of been uh, changing what we mean by power. Historically, political scientists focused on you know military power, and then there was the moment of economic power, and then Joe Nye gave us soft power. Um, but uh, you take soft power and hard power and re-weld them together in some ways, right? Because what we're talking about is soft power effects. How many tweets is who received? My, my phone is vibrating because I know this event is being tweeted as we, we talk about it. But also the power of the platform, which is a hard power area that lies under that. And I think um, for those of us in political science who've sort of really thought about soft power as distinct from hard power, you're showing us that the two are inextricably intertwined with regard to how you control the network. Um, and, uh, and that then puts us in a race, right? It's the race between states trying to do so and others trying to stay one step ahead of states. To me, that's a dangerous way for sort of the future of, of freedom of expression and the power of the state to play out, uh, a technological race uh, where one is always one step ahead of the other. And I think that's precisely because we don't yet have... Um, the solutions to the jurisprudence of the platform. Not only do we not have the solutions, we don't yet have the moral answers that we're comfortable with. Um, the regulation, you know, freedom of speech in, in a, a legal sense has never been absolute, right? The first big European Court of Human Rights case on it about the little red school book says, no, you can't publish the book in England or you don't have to publish the book in England. Um, and we spend 50 years uh, in, in sort of human rights law grappling with where we draw the borders between appropriate regulation uh, and the right to impart and receive information. We now operate in a world, however, where the borders that allowed us to sort of cabin off and say, OK, the social norms of the UK of the little old ladies drinking tea means that they can have their separate, uh, you know, their, their separate social norms. We're, we're now in a world where that has broken down, but yet we the, the old resolutions we had for how and where we draw those lines fail us. Um, so, Monroe, what you have done is give us the vocabulary to begin to think about that. You have given us the frameworks and mental mod and challenges to our mental models to do so. 
Thankfully, you haven't given us the solutions because they don't exist yet. And I think what that says is you've laid out a research agenda that brings together law, communications, political science, and even morality and philosophy, not to mention technology, because this resolution, unlike the one that we reached in the European Court of Human Rights, which could really be about law and morality and perhaps religion, this is a solution that we need the engineers, we need the technologists, uh, and we need to all be speaking a common language. And so thank you for giving us uh, at least the beginnings of that language. And I look forward to the work we will all have to do together as we try to come up with some solutions there. It's also a good advertisement for Perry Worldhouse. Do you want to say one word about Perry? This is because... We're a place that can try to bring together those different communities to have exactly that conversation, but um, we'll be opening in about a year, and uh, hopefully this is the kind of conversation we can have there. But I won't steal your thunder with any more on World House. So uh, one thing that this reminded me of thinking about today is it's been about a decade since I've been here at Annenberg. I, I think it's that maybe Michael knows the answer to that. but <laughs> No, but it's, it's probably about 10 years. And, and one, of the, one of the questions was... Did, did I, what did I learn during the 10 years here, and how did it influence the writing of this book? So this, this question of what, how we think about law, how we think about law as lawyers, and how we think about law as communications scientists, so to speak, uh, is really interesting. And w one of the things that's been fascinating to me is the logic of law, the kind of, and Ellen referred to this, the kind of ineluctable logic that takes things step by step and, and hard, doesn't have a way of developing the consequences of it, and also sees the law, and you've worked on this a lot, which is sees the law as cabined by the assumptions within the state in which the law has been formatted. So how do you break out of that? How do you develop it, et cetera, et cetera? So I, looking over this book, it, it struck me I could never have written it had I just stayed in the law school, even if it were Yale Law School, uh, 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 but but it's 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 it was a really interesting phenomenon, which is what's what's wrong with law and what's the danger of law as we have come to know it and practice it in the United States and in the world. That's is, for you. Is that the, a question? It's it's a comment. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll give one a, a brief answer to that. So let me start by saying last night I was uh, judging the first year law students in their moot court competition they have to do down at the federal courthouse. And the first thing that's wrong with law is I couldn't find a place to plug in my phone, much less uh, a Wi-Fi network. But one of the things is, you know, law has not yet come to understand technology, right? Um, it does, it addresses it in certain cases by applying existing legal theories and frameworks um, that were developed in a different context. But because of the way the legal brain thinks and is trained, uh, it doesn't deal well with what you might call, um, you know, sort of asymptotic change in the way the world works, um, because it's about continuity and applying existing concepts to new facts. Uh, so part of the challenge, I think, of why law has struggles here is just this difficulty and slowness in adapting. Um, but I also, I also think there's a, a more fundamental problem, which is just what you said. Law is based around states. When I got into international law, I thought, oh, this is great. I'm in a place where I'm above and beyond the state. No, no, no. You're actually deeply rooted in the state. Uh, yet globalism and communication is immediately about getting beyond the state. And so how we, we uh, you know, bring those, the, how we resolve that tension, uh, I think, will determine whether law really can work in this space at all. I, I wanted just to highlight is the transfrontier nature of this. And the example I thought of on the train coming down here was Netanyahu's speech to Congress. So this is an example of an external actor trying very important ways to influence public opinion in the United States. Nothing wrong with that. It maybe goes to the pluralism model, a question of how you deal with this issue. But it was an opportunity to think through not very well. Uh, what's, the way to, what's the way to consider these issues? Should, should, who should speak when and where and what? Should RT have the right to be able to propagandize within the United States? Should wh what do we mean by the China's going out policy? What's the reaction to that? What arrangements are there among states to mediate their their version of hate speech or between, let's say, Ukraine and Russia? What's the what's the discussion between Europe the European Union and Russia over 
how can Russia communicate both within Ukraine and within Russia itself? So these are all issues I think that are also quite important and also deal with the issues of law. Anyway, how about comments or questions from the audience? Does anybody have any? Barbie? Um, I'll jump in. And I want to say to begin with that I haven't yet had the time to look at the volume. So I apologize for that. Um, but I, I hope that I'm not what I'm about to say doesn't completely um, negate. We'll, we'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> so it, it strikes me that, that I mean, anxiety, anxiety is a heightened emotional response to uncertainty. Um, but there's a whole lot more certainty about uncertainty than we like to admit, particularly in institutional platforms like law, like journalism, like politics. So why the, why the resistance? Why, why do we keep, I mean, why, like why a, 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 a modicum that focuses on anxiety, that implies uncertainty, when we know much more? None of this, for instance, regarding ISIS, I think, is surprising. And yet we continue to feign or to respond with surprise. And so I, I guess I'm, yeah, I don't know if, did I get to my question? Well, I'm not sure. I, I guess the question has to do with disruption as well. I, I, the anxiety here is the anxiety, one of them is the anxiety of those in power seeing the effectiveness of information at basically dissolving monopolies that exist to dis dissolving empires, uh, thinking of things that disappear like in a day, the Soviet Union, et cetera, et cetera. How does this happen? What is the relationship between information and disruption of standard uh, ar arrangements, et cetera? So China, for example, is, a, is an area of great anxiety over the capacity of information to undo uh, what, the, <coughs> what holds the society together or what holds people in power. You can look at it either way. Yeah. Ellen, do you have anything to say about that? I'm just, I mean, there's certainty that there's going to be disruption. I think the velocity of the disruption is, if it doesn't make us more anxious, it makes us more fearful or, or um, and you can certainly see that with ISIS. I mean, you know, when, when the president called ISIS a JV team, um, that and then it turned and the velocity with which it turned from JV to varsity um, and the velocity mm. which so and journalists you know journalists the anxiety is starting in 2011 right with the death of journalism um, and all the reports about oh, that's been going on much longer than 2011 <laughs> well right uh, maybe maybe um, 2011 was when it came on the radar screens of lawyers because we were asked to sort of intervene um, with legislation but I. Uh, I don't know. Is that, or would you say that that's is anxiety the wrong word for it? And but but you but you understand the the some I sort of emotional anxiety response? absolutely resonates, and it bothers me that it resonates. I mean, I, mm. I, 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 w I wonder why it is that we keep we keep moving back to that trope in trying to understand deviations from our expectations. I just I I. Yeah. Well, let's take the other expectation, sort of the anxiety of hope. So the hope that with new technology, social media, we're all liberated, we can, it's a great new world, et cetera, et cetera. So I look at net neutrality as an example of anxiety in the society, as an example of, of kind of obsessing about something because some fear that it's all going wrong. Uh, which is predictable. That is to say, you can look at each technology and say there were all these hopes and aspirations and they somehow soured. So uh, I think it's, it's that anxiety too which I think is, is, is important. Carolyn, you're a historian of anxieties. Yeah, I, I would only say that I don't know that there's ever been a time that we weren't anxious. I think it comes with any commitment to freedom of expression because what is supposed to be the point of freedom of expression? Well, it's to allow people to participate and determine themselves what the outcome will be. And, you know, there's going to be conflict and disagreement. We don't know what the truth is, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, I'm, I would have to agree with Monroe and with Ellen. It's that new arenas of anxiety are always especially anxiety producing, but we shouldn't forget how anxious older ones made us, even though we're 
we can't remember stuff about it. Like, and I'm thinking of, you know, around the First World War, or I'm thinking of in the 60s. And all of these were very, very anxious times uh, for freedom of expression, even though the sort of fence, I mean, well, think of World War One. There you had, uh, and I'm thinking of um, <clears throat> Shank and Abrams, these kinds of foundational decisions in which external competitors were coming in and uh, challenging the narrative of legitimacy that was the American state fighting the First World War. And there was a huge amount of anxiety, and there were bombings, and there were there was all kinds of destruction. And, you know, we don't remember that at all. But if you read that history, it's certainly there. And then the, the anxiety of the 60s was a lot more localized in the United States. But it was a very uncertain time, you know, of maybe the whole thing is going to fall apart kind of stuff. And so, you know, I think there's these... Uh, it's not that the anxiety, the intensity of the anxiety is constant for the whole society. I think it tends to focus on enclaves of anxiety at different times. But there certainly are historical moments in which the entire society is incredibly anxious about the, the destructiveness of, of freedom of expression, which I think is exactly the right word. Um, and and the three that I just mentioned would be though among those, you know, and then there's older periods of time like the Civil War. So, you know, we shouldn't be too enamored of our own anxiety in that sense, but recognize that each historical moment has its own particular specific challenges that we have to address. And this one looks pretty daunting, you know, because it's global and it is fast. Velocity is the word that Ellen used, and I think very appropriately. And all of those things are part of the moment in which we find ourselves. I just wonder, too, if there's something about um, uh, sort of the totalizing effect of these networks and our dependency on them, and that we don't, you know, there's an internet kill switch which can immediately um, take us out of communication, if that's what you're worried about, for the, for the um, anti-net neutrality uh, people, it was sort of the mobilization of the mob to support this um, proposal, which actually is kind of, it, I mean, that is a clear expression of anxiety, the net neutrality proponents, because nothing's happened. Um, it's just anxiety about what might happen and the totalizing effect that it can, that one decision in these very concentrated networks um, can have. So we're totally dependent on these technologies. We don't really understand how they work, and we don't really understand who controls hmm. them. Michael. So this, I think this, this first of all, a great panel. Um, this discussion about why I like anxiety. the parts that were laudatory. What's I, that? <laughs> I like the parts that were laudatory. <laughs> <laughs> so you must like most of it. Um, this discussion about why so much anxiety now, is it different, um, I think is a really important one. And uh, I agree with the premise of Barbie's uh, question and Carolyn's comments that you look at it more historically, there have been moments of anxiety in the past and great anxiety at some of those moments. And Carolyn pointed to some of the really important ones. But to me, the issue is there is a kind of what's the, the conclusion of that sentence? Um, the, the premise of the question and Carolyn's comments, uh, as I read them, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that, and I'm going to exaggerate it, so we've, had, we've been anxious in the past and we've come out of it. What's the big deal? I'm overstating it, and you clearly said this is a, a daunting one. And I think the issue really is, and this is an academic issue that we face in a lot of these moments, um, is is this moment different? Is the you know we get anxiety because of cha potential change that could be quite disruptive. In the past, we can look and say, and we came out of it, defining the we differently. Is there a reason to think that that's, good? that's automatically the case? And this one is bigger, faster, so there's that piece of it. Maybe we won't come out of it. The second part of it's a little more subtle, but in all the examples you gave, Carolyn, we came out of it, but we came out of it really different, and uh, it's a hard question, but did we come out of it better or worse, preserving what we value and don't value? I'm not clear on that. You know, After World War I, we were a different world, and we lost a lot of things. And so I think we have great capacity to think, oh, you know, we survived, so we're okay. 
But each of those moments brought about change that have normative implications, I think. And so I totally get the idea that we are in a normative, an anxious moment, the outcome of which I think it's fair to say is unclear, even if they've been resolved in the past. And that can mean unclear like everything goes to hell, but it can mean unclear in things will change in ways that we aren't even aware of that, that are not necessarily good or better. And so that, I think that's why I think this is a really important discussion right now. Could I respond yeah, to that immediately? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm very pessimistic, actually, myself. But I would say the moment that we compare, and I don't, I think a lot of very positive stuff got set up, you know, started rolling in, in terms of the American jurisprudence response to World War I. But I, I think the important historical comparison is is a technological comparison and the difference between the anxiety that accompanied the introduction of the printing press, you know, and what we got out of that was the Reformation and we got 30 years war, you know, and all kinds of really bad stuff in terms of the the disruption in in terms. Now, out of that came this enlightenment settlement of, you know, of the separation of church and state and stuff like that. But I think it's comparable to that. The, the printing press, I think, is comparable in its, um, you know, transformative potential for the whole society to, to digital technology, clearly. And, and so I think, I think, I think it's not like the 60s. I think it's not like World War I. I think it's really different. And I don't think it's at all clear what's going to happen. But, you know, uh, whatever it is, it will be incredibly bumpy. I'm sure of that. And bumpy, yeah. So I, I don't think it's going to be a conflict-free zone. On the other hand, I think it's going to ramp up, and it's already ramping up a great deal of conflict in which a lot of people will be very damaged. Well, I'll add one, one thought to that, which is, you know, the speed with which and the depth to which these technologies have transformed lives. You know, I'm, I'm no historian, but it took a while for the printing press to become widespread and touch on the vast majority of society, yet in a decade or two at most, so many people, so I think that's part of, you know, we, we've just reestablished to a new normal that involves all of these things, and then you start to wor worry, where, where, where do they go? Comments, and then maybe we'll have to conclude. So, Mr. Fish, who has a cartoon exhibit downstairs in the forum, uh, Gabriella Coleman and Gobin. So, and then we'll respond collectively. Okay, yeah. I, one thing I, th I think should be talked about is uh, just to speak about what you were talking about about anxiety. I, the way I interpreted your question was, um, I think there's a difference between your public self and your private self. And I think that um, you're going to exhibit more anxiety in a public space than you, is truly believable to you in a private space. And I think that the virtual reality of the internet and social media and what we're dealing with, what we're talking about, with, as far as um, free speech issues and so forth, um, it's the first time really when we're dealing with a virtual reality where people feel like they're being political, they feel like they're being intelligent about things, but they're not being they're not being publicly active. They're not really being political. Um, it's, it's a much more spectatorship situation for people. I think that's what technology has done. So one thing that should be addressed, I think, is um, there's a lot more communication. There's a lot more uh, interaction between people. And there's, a, there's, a, there's this sense that the community is getting bigger. But it's, it's virtual. We're not going to be as brave about committing our, our, our thinking to real physical action, real political action in society, because we're so existing in this, in this virtual world that doesn't really have serious uh, ramifications, I think, out off the internet. Thank you. Gabrielle? So um, my question is a little bit of a methodological question, and, and maybe anyone in the panel can speak to this. but. I spent you know, many years studying anonymous, which was incredibly hard to study and access. Uh, but I didn't have to sign an NDA. And in the end, I could access anonymous. And I actually think that studying Twitter or Google or Facebook, who are these new arbiters of you know, soft and hard power, can be incredibly difficult to access. And there's a lot that we do know 
uh, because they release policy statements, because you can have relationships with people, because there's leaks. But I do wonder what we lose because it's so hard as social scientists to access these institutions and, and study them. So um, does this contribute to kind of the lack of understanding about what's going on? Or is there kind of enough information out there that gets out there through policy reports, relationships, uh, and leaking to understand the role of these institutions? Um, you have a set of yeah, um, so I, I thought this is really exciting. And uh, one of the discussion about anxieties, but mostly at the level of big institutions, nice, you know, big structural historical chain sweeping you know, across the world, right? So the, the state, corporations, Google, you know, First Amendment, big institutions. So my question is about what's happening on the ground, or how does what's happening on the ground help us to understand your strategic narratives, or you know, in what ways can regular people, users, you know, citizens, um, what role do they play in your strategic narratives? Or how can we use those strategic narratives to understand <coughs> everyday experiences in this time of um, whatever certainty or uncertainty? Actually, I think it goes a little bit to the question of audiences, etc. cetera, that, uh, that Bill mentioned, which is a strategic narrative is only effective if it has some resonance with the, with the ground. This was true in um, thinking of Libya and thinking of Egypt, et cetera, et cetera. What's the resonance between what's happening on the social media level and what's happening at the strategic narrative level? So um, I, I, there was an article in today's New York Times. This is going to be a plug for, there's a very interesting article about the breakdown of the British, the, uh, not the, the board of the, it's not called the British, our, our board of governors, the, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, the okay. Voice of America, which is falling apart. It's really weird. And part of the process problem is that there's no relationship between the way it deploys a narrative and those who listen to it. There's no grounding, and people perceive this. And part of the, part of the reason, by the way, is it's very uncertain about what its narrative should be. It's caught between a kind of propagandistic view and an objective view, so the quote objective view. So uh, trying, uh, in, in all this, these societies, I think there's been a significant question of how, uh, how and I, maybe I, another, another way to defer to Bill on this question, which is, is there a cabal of people in the State Department who think about strategic narratives? That is to say, the strategic narrative of Syria, et cetera, et cetera, and what's the relationship between how this message will be received and will be accepted as having some potential future, et cetera. I don't think that's a totally, it's not the answer that you want, but it's, a, it's, it's an answer about how good a bedtime story this is. is are the people who are the targets of this, are they listening? Will they think of this as something that lulls them into a, a sense of a new way of thinking about life? Or is it, is it distant? Is it only representing the impetus of the sender and not the receiver, as it were? So is there such a cabal? I mean, I, uh, uh, and it depends again on who the audience is. There's the audience of leaders and there's the audience of humans in the street. And, and this goes to conceptions of democracy, of, of how important it is to reach down deeply into societies and change their conceptions, et cetera. So my, my short answer is I think the US State Department lost the ability to shape any narrative many, many years ago, uh, probably at, at the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, but uh, fundamentally, no, right? You have an office of public diplomacy that does not know how to do diplomacy, as far as I can tell, most of the time. Uh, but uh, really, I think the story is a broader one, right? Which is that no one owns the, the narrative anymore, right? It's a collective narrative, and it's a narrative that is, in fact, shaped by the very questions that your book raises, right? Who owns um, the platforms? Who controls, you know, what's that jurisprudence look like? Who uh, you know, owns the infrastructure? That's the narrative, and the fact that no one can really own it or control it. And when someone figures out a way to do it, that's when we get scared. 
shared. It's the ISIS moment where suddenly they're able to create and shape a narrative and we can't respond to it um, that I think is, is where we have the greatest anxiety. Can, can, you want to speak about the methodology? Go ahead and talk about this, and then we'll talk about it. No, we'll continue here, and then... I was just going to say two things. First of all, another relativizing comment about the audience, um, and that is, that's exactly what print did. It made a virtual community, and in fact, it was designed to make a virtual community politically because it was thought to be great to get off the street where the mobs were and where there was this active voting and politics and all this kind of stuff and take it into the library so that... You know, you could put bad stuff out there and, and they couldn't beat you up for it, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that's a new thing, even though it may be different. But in response to Guabin, I was thinking, too, a very, very on-the-ground thing. This is a much less lofty book and analytical than, than Monroe is talking about, but this new thing that John Ronson has put out about, you know, so you've been publicly shamed. Nevertheless, I think there are... Uh, concepts that Monroe brings to this that are very interesting. So this business that we're all suddenly find ourselves apart in the State Department and, you know, ISIS and all that stuff, uh, subject to being shamed by Twitter, you know, and this kind of huge avalanche of criticism that comes in in ways that are totally unfamiliar to us uh, in terms of our sort of cultural familiarity. And so our own narrative of legitimacy is, is under assault. Uh, and these are very asymmetric conditions because it's one little person in the huge, you know, Twitter web and Twitter universe. And, um, and then the market for loyalties, you know. So I think there are a lot of concepts in that Monroe is bringing to bear that that have to do with people's very personal social networks, quite apart from from you know state action and and that sort of thing. So I would only add that uh, I think on the ground there's also huge anxieties that have not so much to do with Charlie Hebdo or or you know. Uh, that kind of stuff, but just, you know, everybody in my class now thinks I'm terrible kind of stuff. Um, what about Gabriella's question about methodology? Oh, sorry. Um, I, I can say just a brief word. I think, I think you're right in that, uh, though, though part of this is true whenever we're social scientists trying to study uh, private institutions that don't have uh, open doors and, and warm uh, receptions for us, uh, with public institutions, usually, at least in a country like the United States, you have mechanisms to get at data. Um, but uh, I, I, what, I, what I'd want to think more about is whether you know Google uh, or, or its peers is any different than if we were studying the automobile industry, trying to get inside of Ford, you know, at some point. Um, <clears throat> that I'm not sure of, but I do think anytime you're trying to get into a private institution, uh, and one that are a little afraid themselves, right? They, you know, they, they, they are not very transparent. So I agree with the challenge. I'm not sure of the solution. I, I, <coughs> to put me. it slightly in terms of my book, the question might be, the extent to which governments who have a stake in how effective these institutions are and how they operate and how they affect public opinion, how they affect potential for disruption, themselves study these institutions and create opportunities for those institutions to be studied by them by having keys to the back mm -hmm. door and a variety of other techniques. So uh, it may be that social scientists uh, have less capacity, but social scientists who are, who are linked to government may have more in some way. I don't know. Another unresolved, you know, methodological question I think that's new is what is a sample? You know, I mean, there's the public private thing, but you know, if you've got the whole web in front of you, how do you decide how to come to any coherent uh, conclusion about what constitutes a legitimate sample for whatever it is that you're trying to study? I think that's a really hard question that we don't know the answer to. So I, I'd also like to say a lot of the people around the table or people who are no longer around the table were, have been very helpful here at, at uh, Annenberg and at Penn, uh, graduate students, faculty, et cetera. And, and a lot of the issues that are dealt with here have been issues that the Center for Global Communication Studies have dealt with. And it's really been a treat to, uh, to work with the institution and with our faculty and students and with colleagues around the campus. Thank you very much. <laughs>